So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, distinguished guests and speakers. My name is Rodrigo Cabral, and I'm delighted to represent my colleagues in the World Bank Treasury as Master of Ceremonies and welcome you to the 2018 Sovereign Debt Management Forum. It is both an honor and a privilege to start the day by introducing Managing Director and World Bank Chief Financial Officer Joaquin Levy. In this position, Joaquin is responsible for the financial and risk management strategies of the World Bank Group and represents the group at the Financial Stability Board. Before joining the bank in 2016, Joaquin served as Minister of Finance of Brazil, and prior to that, he was CEO of Bradesco Asset Management, which is the asset, uh, asset management arm of Brazil's second largest private bank. Before 2010, Joaquin held several key positions in the Brazilian government, such as Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Finance of the State of Rio de Janeiro, and also several positions at the IMF. Uh, Mr. Levy holds a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. So please join me in welcoming Managing Director and World Bank Group Chief Financial Officer Joaquin Levy. Thank you, Rodrigo. It's very good to be here. Um, I mean, as Rodrigo mentioned, I had the privilege uh, at some point uh, to be uh, the treasurer of Brazil responsible, among other things, with the issuance of that. Uh, it's, it's a great job and uh, a tremendous responsibility. And uh, Marcello was just telling me uh, what a diversified, sophisticated audience we, we have here. Uh, we're representatives of all sorts of countries, developed countries, advanced economies, uh, as well as developing countries. So um, let me basically have a quick overview about the economic outlook and some of the challenges it brings to us, and then uh, 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 some discussion about the structural things, because I think it's very important. We all see the kind of cycle we are uh, living now and uh, with the normalization, etc. But uh, I think that especially when you talk about uh, emerging markets, development countries, you have to look beyond the cycle and to be sure that the fundamental structural things are in the right place because um, there's so much promise uh, beyond uh, the cycle. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, when you see all the challenges around, um, it uh, really reminds us uh, the importance of uh, the World Bank and uh, how uh, critical the role of a, of a, a reliable, neutral partner uh, we have to, to, to have uh, dealing with our countries. And, and frankly, coming back from uh, Bali, I can only be grateful and encouraged by the great support of our shareholders, your government. Um, they have provided to us. As you know, we have just completed the, the capital increase, in particular with the World Bank. We're almost there for IFC, and it has been the largest ever uh, capital increase. Um, so let me give these thoughts about the global outlook. I think that uh, uh, we know that uh, low interest rates in the wake of uh, the, the financial crisis has led uh, to capital flows to developing countries in search of uh, higher yields. Um, the implications have been really quite uh, important. We have seen the increase of uh, issuance in uh, uh, local currencies um, with reducing the FX risk, although for many uh, issuers, many of our clients, uh, foreign debt is still important, but I think this is a very relevant and structural change. Now, when you see the, the central bank uh, pursuing uh, policy normalization, um, uh, we, we have seen a decline uh, in capital flows and funding have been, has become a little bit more difficult, but still we don't see major uh, reversals. But, of course, that, including corporate debt, uh, has reached the unprecedented level and is back in, in the radar. And uh, as we, we, we go to this normalization, uh, it really gets to the forefront of our uh, considerations. 
Um, and uh, of course, uh, we have seen adjustments in uh, um, exchange rates and as well as in equity prices in, in many uh, jurisdictions. Now, if interest rates continue to, ra to rise slowly, I think the supported reflecting uh, strengthened growth in, uh, in main economies like the, the US, I think that the financing conditions and capital flows to emerging markets and developing economies will continue to be generally uh, supportive. But even in this uh, benign scenario, um, it is important that countries be prepared to uh, sail uh, through this uh, adjustment period, say the next 18, maybe 24 months, uh, until rates uh, here in the U.S. Uh, is stabilized. And of course, for some countries, also the evolution in the euro area will be increasingly uh, important. But there are risks. Maybe you don't get this uh, uh, such a benign scenario, and uh, we can um, have surprise in the, in the pace of monetary tightening for whatever reasons. So of course, we have a, a denouement of a Brexit and um, all the trade tensions. Uh, all of these uh, can create uh, not only a desynchronized uh, the recovery that uh, could lead to monetary uh, uh, divergence and uh, impact on, on asset prices, but uh, of course, of uh, course, uh, particularly the, the, the trade tensions can have a very important impact on emerging markets and developing economies because uh, they are vulnerable not only to direct effects but also to indirect effects. Because uh, these tensions bring higher uncertainty about policy strategies and this erodes confidence and, of course, the willingness of investment. Um, also, we can have less efficient, disrupted global supply chains, which uh, affect very often the sectors that are the most dynamic in uh, uh, developing economies. And uh, I, I was recently I I stricken by uh, a study, for instance, that was done in the ASEAN uh, group. Uh, the, the proportion of ASEAN ex exports that, for instance, go to China is extremely significant. significant. So uh, any shock uh, in, in uh, say, trade with China, you have a very important repercussion in all these countries, Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia, etc. So you have to think about these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, say, second uh, uh, waves. And of course, all this uncertainty is reflected in higher uh, premium. Now, I would say that so far the good news is that you have not seen any case of really widespread contagion. Um, countries have been impacted but all of these in different ways uh, by the, the headwinds uh, and, and primarily reflecting their country specific uh, uh, pressure than as uh, say sudden general change of mood or global risk appetite. So. Like I mentioned, the, the non-resident portfolios, the inflows, have continued to be relatively, uh, uh, remain resilient. And uh, I think this reflects the fact that for many countries, the response to the shock since uh, 2014 have been a quite, uh, say, disciplined. Even like Latin America, you, you see the reaction, even fiscal reaction, has been uh, uh, very different than in the past. And of course, countries that are facing more challenging situations, we think about Argentina, Ukraine, more recently Pakistan, they've been uh, uh, willing to take uh, in an early stage uh, discipline uh, with uh, the, the IMF and the getting support uh, to, to address their vulnerability, also with the help of uh, the World Bank. And I have to say that we at the World Bank, we take very seriously to be prepared uh, to respond to the needs of the global economy. And again, the capital increase is an important factor to, to give us uh, dry powder uh, to do that, but also our permanent dialogue with uh, uh, countries and really new ways to foster uh, the structural reforms where they are necessary. But let me shift um, uh, to structural uh, issues. And I think that, uh, um, like I said, uh, we have to, to, to recognize that uh, cycles come and go, and this is natural, but when you think about uh, emerging markets, uh, we have to recognize that more and more they would shape the future of the global economy. Uh, the large economies like uh, China, India, but also uh, the others we 
Very recently in Indonesia, you see everything that is happening there. It's very clear that uh, uh, this uh, is, uh, has a special uh, dynamics. And uh, we have to, 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 to think also what it means at the global level in terms of the imbalance between savings and investment. Now, low interest rates, I think, uh, reflect more than a decision of uh, monetary policy. And of course, uh, 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 Professor uh, Raghav will, will talk about, uh, um, say, um, secular stagnation, other theories. But the fact is that, uh, yes, there are some indications that uh, um, we have a higher savings in, in many instances because of demographics. I mean, uh, the, the baby boomers, it's the peak in terms of, of savings for, for sustaining their lives in the next 20, 30 uh, years. At the same time, we're seeing more and more a shift in the demand for, for capital because the most dynamic areas in most economies are not capital intensive. I mean, we all the time we have here discussions about uh, artificial intelligence, about all these things. They're not capital uh, intensive. So the, the consequence is that in a way you have a surplus of capital. And this capital, uh, which actually in many cases is savers, uh, uh, worker savings, um, they, they are not finding uh, a return. And there are some studies, um, some of you are familiar with, for instance, uh, uh, Professor Zingali's uh, studies and many others that have shown that the return in, uh, of, of capital as a, a production factor has dropped actually more than return of labor. The, the return of controlling firms, of uh, intellectual property, these kind of things has skyrocketed, but not capital. And this means that um, we, there is a search for, uh, say, outlays, where you can find meaningful, uh, say, users of this capital. And we believe that uh, emerging markets uh, can be one of these outlays, where you can have uh, uh, adequate risk-adjusted returns, uh, especially when you think about uh, infrastructure and climate-friendly uh, infrastructure. Now, infrastructure, um, of course, is still capital intensive, even if you think about, uh, um, say, uh, um, uh, 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 for supporting communications, this kind of thing, it's still very capital intensive. The, the question is how you can make this something that you generate uh, long-term stable, uh, say, income flow. And there is where uh, uh, the, the, in, uh, the multilateral institution like us have a very important uh, uh, role of uh, trying to reduce the inherent risk of some of uh, these uh, uh, investment opportunities by dialogue with countries, by building uh, a regulatory, uh, a business, a legal uh, environment that is favorable to, to investment, and at the same time also looking from the side of, uh, of uh, investors or savers if there are say, regulatory hurdles that make it more difficult to invest uh, there. In this, in this uh, uh, in instance, one thing that we've been looking is partnering, for instance, with rating agencies to look what is the actual uh, risk profile of infrastructure. And the good news is that um, infrastructure has a risk profile that is quite favorable uh, especially after construction phase, uh, the, the, for instance, uh, studies from Moody showed that the probability of default of, uh, of uh, the infrastructure asset, uh, loans, uh, bank loans, etc., dropped to levels that are equivalent uh, to um, investment grade. So when you look, uh, for instance, uh, uh, to, to debt for infrastructure over the lifetime, of this debt, the expected losses are much lower than equivalent corporate bonds. Uh, so we've been engaging in a, in a dialogue with regulators uh, to see if these would uh, allow uh, for lower capital charges. And uh, I could mention that both at the level of FSB as well as more recently in the very interesting report uh, published by the eminent persons group the, for the G20, there is a call for, uh, based on empirical fact, to reassess uh, the risk, the capital need, especially for institutional investors, for instance, insurance companies, uh, to, um, 
to invest in infrastructure. And why is this important? Not only because, like I mentioned, it creates new outlays for global uh, uh, savings, but also because uh, the demands for uh, uh, infrastructure are very large. And uh, if you can shift that from the burden of, say, the government uh, borrowing needs to be something more financed to the private sector, this definitely has a positive impact on the management of the public debt, on the, on the budget of, of governments. So uh, we understand that to uh, get uh, um, to achieve the goals that we all have in terms of uh, sustainable development uh, in the next uh, few years to 2030, the, you need a massive uh, ramp up in uh, investment, particularly in infrastructure, but this cannot be done uh, on, the, on, the, on the budget of, of government. You have to create the right conditions to attract the private capital. And this will help, like you say, in both sides uh, of the, the global economy. Um, so I think that uh, for, this is the biggest challenge for, for the World Bank, also because of all the impacts in terms of, uh, uh, say, uh, climate change. Uh, infrastructure is a major source of, uh, of uh, emissions, uh, tr uh, transit, etc. So addressing this in, in the right way, thinking for the next uh, uh, decades, it's uh, something that can increase the potential growth of countries, can relieve uh, the, the, the fiscal burden in, in these countries while creating, um, say, ways to balance this uh, discrepancy between uh, savings and investment uh, opportunities, especially for uh, long-term investors. So I think that uh, uh, the, the, the interconnection between this and the general uh, management of that, you become more and more uh, uh, important, and uh, the, the, you can count on the World Bank to be really in the forefront of discussing these, both at host countries as well as global financial regulators, so that we can increase the flows to finance uh, all its needs to achieve the sustainable development goals and bring uh, more stability and growth to uh, developing economies and uh, with, through these uh, uh, eliminate extreme poverty and share prosperity around the globe, which is our mission. Thank you very much.